Okay, full screens, microphone, perfect, we're good to go. Um, so I'm excited to be here again. Um, so I think my third year presenting here at the symposium. Um, and as noted, I've kind of changed things a little bit this year. I've split the presentation into two pieces. The, the first piece, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the trends in, in technology over the past year and then what's coming in the future, or at least what consumers want in the future. And the second half, we're going to talk about engaging the consumer. Um, I think you know, one of the things that we've seen is that this group really understands the technology, but um, how, do, how do we address the consumer, talk to the consumer, and get the consumer engaged? Um, so before we get into that, a little bit of background, um, next couple slides about what I am and who I am. Um, this is not my full-time job. My full-time job has me designing uh, primarily data centers and enterprise infrastructure. I, I travel around the world. I spend uh, more time outside of home than inside of home. Um, and speaking of which, my home is now in, in Paris. I moved there back in July. Um, so I'm there for, I don't know, until I, I get done with Paris. So three, five years, something like that. Um, not in any hurries. Um, and, you know, it, nights and weekends is really when I do all this, all the writing and all the, the content. And so um, I'm a competitive triathlete, or at least I try to be. Um, I've completed Ironmans and marathons um, and a whole lot of other races that, are, that tend to be more enjoyable than Ironmans and marathons um, from a pain standpoint. Um, I love to travel, as evidenced by the amount of travel I've, I've, I do. Um, I think this, this month I've been in, I think, four or five or six countries already. And the next few weeks I'm in, in more countries and I'm three continents over the next three weeks. So. I'm busy. Um, and then outside of that, I eat lots of cupcakes. Um, I'm, I'm officially the, the tester in residence at my, my wife's upcoming um, cupcakery in, in Paris. So uh, that's kind of my, my job in, in short. Um, so what is DCRainmaker.com? Um, for those of you who don't know it, um, it's been around or just a little over five years now. It started in September of 2007. Um, and my focus or what I'm best known for is my in-depth reviews. But that's not all I write. I write about me, my life. Um, really, it's, it's a lot like any other blog out there, except that I, um, I drop these little presents of 60-page in-depth reviews every week or two. Um, but, but beyond that, it's about my training. It's about everything from what I cooked this past weekend or going to the vegetable market in France. It's just, it's just what interests me as, as, a, as a person. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's been so successful, is that it's a blend of things. It's not just technology every single day. Um, reviews are the, the primary driver of traffic to the site, um, especially from search and from, from other links. Um, so that's, that's how I, I've become known. Um, just to put it in perspective, I get about one million um, page views a month, um, and about half of that is unique people. So um, that's 500,000 unique individuals coming by to read product reviews every month. Um, on top of that, there's about 10,000 daily RSS subscribers, people that are consuming that content through applications like Google Reader and, and the sort. Um, and then I've got a bunch of social media followers as well across Twitter and Facebook um, and Google+. Um, and, and I've been growing pretty consistently over the last three years. It's, it just continues to grow as the, as the marketplace um, continues to expand, the number of products continues to expand. Um, you're seeing the interest expand. You know, if you went back five years ago, there was really only a handful of players in the marketplace, right? Garmin and Polar were the big two with a bunch of small ones in between. And, and what I'm seeing now is that We've got still Garmin and Polar, the big ones, but there's a lot of other products that have elevated up into that same range, right? Um, you know, Timex, Magellan, all, you can, all of you are those products, and you're seeing that the consumer interest is there as well. Um, you know, one of the big questions I get asked is how I make money um, on the site, and, and I do make money on the site. Um, it's the only way I can, I can justify the time um, to my wife to go ahead and be able to, you know, spend this many hours doing this. Um, as much as I love doing all this, it's just tough to spend that many hours. Um, so everything is on, on affiliate links, which means that if you go and read a review and, and you like um, what you read, you can go and buy it on Amazon, um, and I got a small amount back. Um, I don't accept any direct advertising from any of the products I review. Um, there is some Google AdSense advertising up there now, and you know, if you're searching on a refrigerator, then you'll get an ad for a refrigerator. Um, so it's kind of typical Google AdSense contextual um, searching. But uh, I think that covers barely enough for a a cheeseburger at McDonald's on a given day. So it's, it's not a whole lot of revenue. Most of it's all via Amazon. Um, but I, I don't ever plan to take advertising revenue from um, really this audience here. That's something that I don't, I don't think you can maintain that, that separation if you take money from the same people who review. It just, it just doesn't work. Um, so looking at devices that I reviewed in the last 12 months, I was, I was sitting out there trying to put all these little pictures in here. Um, and then eventually I gave up after I don't know how many pictures are there right now. Um, these are just the last 12 months on items that I reviewed or in process for review or I've talked about. Um, this is probably half of them in total. Um, I, I talk and, and look and play with a lot of, a lot of products. Um, a large majority of them make it to the full stage review um, point, but some of them don't, um, either because uh, 
a lot of interesting reasons. You know, the product isn't, isn't ready or um, it's just not interesting to me. Um, that's one of the things I, I try to drive for is that um, ultimately I'm doing this in my spare time and so I want to make it enjoyable to me. Um, I, don't like about, like about, I don't like writing about products that aren't enjoyable for me to use. Um, so I, I tend to focus on those that are enjoyable and I kind of leave the rest behind. Um, as far as product reviews, I use the product a lot. I think, you know, if you look at the product reviews landscape today on the internet, a lot of it tends to be people writing a paragraph and a half and saying this product is good or this product is bad and all they've really done is taken the press release and reworded it, right? And so uh, my goal is to take that product and, and really use it for, for usually an extended period of time. Usually, in, you know, four to six weeks, four to eight weeks is, is not uncommon at all. I've got a, a Polar GPS review that I'll publish sometime this afternoon and I've been using the product since July. And I've got a Phoenix review, Garmin Phoenix, that I'll publish next week, again, using the product since July. Uh, my goal is to really understand the product. I don't think you can do that in just a day. Um, a lot of people consider my reviews their product manuals. That's what I hear a lot. They, they go to the review and they understand how to use the product they just bought. Um, and it's funny, I was finishing up the, the Polar review last night and um, the very last thing I did, and I hadn't read the manual up at this point, was actually look through the manual and validate that I've covered every single item in that manual in my review somewhere in there as far as how that, that item works, that, that particular component works. Um, and that's what people find interesting. Even though I don't expect that everybody's going to read that 60 to 80 page review, which is really what it is if you print it out on a printer, um, they're looking for certain pieces of it, right? And they're looking to find out how does this little thing work. Um, and so that's where I'm really aiming to tell the entire story of the product, not just a small bit of it. Um, and you know, one of the things I try to convey in these reviews and, and why I like coming to conferences like this is because I want to I wanna understand why you made the decisions that you did. I understand that from an engineering standpoint. I understand there's always a balance between the choices that you make from, you know, during your engineering or product. I want to be able to help explain that to customers. I think customers, um, they take it better if they can understand why you didn't put a feature in there or why a feature is a given way rather than just not saying anything at all. Um, if you give them a way to understand it, they can go ahead and, and process that and make the decisions they want to make. And lastly, I beat, I really do beat the crap out of the products. Um, I think, uh, you know, that's, that's important that you understand where the limitations of the products are. Um, so for that, I've got kind of four sorries I've got to say to people. Um, Timex, I'm sorry about your run trainer in the bottom of Lake Michigan. It's still there. Um, bond Treasure, I'm sorry I completely exploded one of your cadence sensors into a million little pieces. It's like taking the glass ornament off a of Christmas tree and throwing it at something. Um, it, the something was a wheel at however many RPMs the back of a wheel spins. Um, Garmin, when you said not to swim with it, what exactly did you mean? Um, <laughs> so there's a few there. And then probably the biggest sensor or biggest sorry goes to Polar um, with their $2,200 power meter. Um, I look at the bright side, I now have multiple Polar power meters. Um, so, you know, there's, I, I aim to, to try to really push these products to limits and understand where they are because I think that's an important piece of, of product reviews. Um, feedback by the millions right now, just to put it in context, as of this morning, there were 244,024 inbound links, um, primarily to product reviews on, across the internet to, to DC or Maker. Um, people are arriving there ready to buy products. Um, they're, they're looking for an answer and they're ready to go ahead and execute on that. Um, I'm getting hundreds of comments streaming in daily. Um, you know, the interesting thing though is that I know I've talked to some of you about this. Use those comments, right? Those comments are people asking questions about products but they're also a gold mine for your, your research and development stage. You can go sit there and look at any given competitor product and understand what people are asking questions about um, and why they're asking questions about it. Some of those products have 800 plus comments on those reviews. Um, that's a lot of comments. That's a lot of people asking a lot of questions and trying to understand how something works and if it fits um, their requirements. My readers are across the board. I mean, we've got Simon who, who reads as an Olympic gold medalist, but I've also got a lot of folks that are trying to lose a lot of weight. Um, and so I'm really catering to, to both ends of that. Um, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm trying to talk to you know, everyone from, from my mom to somebody who has built the product and understands it at the deepest possible level. And I try to bridge those gaps. Um, and interestingly, half the readers are from the US, but half are actually not. Um, they're outside of the US, um, which means that from a product standpoint, I'm focused on products that are across the entire world as opposed to just necessarily one place or the other. Um, and then I also write occasionally for Slow Twitch and Bicycling Magazine and a few other places. So let's talk about technology trends. Um, the first one is connected devices for health. You know, up until really last year, a lot of this, this focus of this audience was on sport, right? On, on the pictures behind me here, right? And on, on people like Simon and, and myself and many of you. Um, 
But as noted right before me, the speaker before me said, the vast majority of folks are interested in health. And that's where we're seeing that shift towards, towards health devices there. And we'll talk about those in a second. The sub $100 GPS watch, um, huge explosion of interest there, right? If you, if you can get a GPS watch at $100 or less, um, you're now competing with phones. And, and I'll talk about that more in detail. Accelerometer functionality, we're seeing that um, into watches, but we're not seeing the use of that yet. Um, barometric altimeter, the same thing. We're seeing that um, added to products to increase altitude data. Um, people aren't putting up with any more altitude data that doesn't look right. Um, Risk-based phone display platforms, I'll talk about that in more detail. Um, all the Kickstarter entrants, and we'll go into each one of these. Um, of course, Bluetooth smart power meters. You know, every year people say that this is the year of power meters. Um, wow, the Twitter's still going, that's awesome. Um, so, <laughs> The, every year people say this is the year of power meters. Um, this is almost the year of power meters, right? We've got a ton of, of products out there that are gonna be there next year. Um, I would not say 2012 is the year of power meters. I would say 2013 is the start of that, maybe 2014, yeah, just based on the products and the, those, um, those today. Cell phone connectivity and integration. Um, not just cell phone apps, but the difference between connecting apps to devices. So first is devices for health and not sport. Um, you know, the $100 price point across the board, you'll see this is, is sort of the, the place you want to be in. Um, these are focusing on kind of three major groups of people. First are folks that want to get healthy. Those are the folks that uh, may have a significant amount of weight to lose today. How do you motivate them um, to go ahead and, and use these devices? And, and this is the way that, you know, they can use Nike Fuel or Fitbit or any of those ones there um, to, to focus on tracking that weight loss um, and their progress towards that. Um, but you also see folks that are already healthy doing this and they want to get credit. Um, and, and what is credit? Well, there's a lot of health fitness programs, or sorry, corporate health and fitness programs today that offer credits for, for how much exercise you do. I've got some, some good friends who, ironically enough, lead a running club um, in DC, and they actually get like a free cruise and a free TV and all these sort of things just by running every two days, which they, they do automatically. Um, so they get credits for that, and these devices are enabling companies to enable their employees to get credits for those things. And that's where you see a lot of these de devices um, establishing those partnerships and then branching out from there. Um, and then the folks that are already really healthy, right, largely this, this group here that are using these devices just purely from a data tracking standpoint. They've, they've got their Garmin to go out and run, you know, their, their 20 mile run and they go back and they, they put on the Fitbit and, and see how many steps they took that day. Um, you know, I, I do, I, when I travel it's fun to look at things and put up on the Nike um, watch or the Fitbit and, and look at how much how much walking they did between airports. Um, the challenge with all these devices though is that by and large they're missing the connection um, between the end user's activity and displaying that, right? A lot of them are, are single mode, they're, they're on that device and that's it. They can't get the data off or they can't do it easily. They have to go plug it in, they plug it into the software and the software has four components, all four components suck. And then the software then uploads it to a site which also sucks, right? And you see this, this, whole, this whole shift there where the user, the consumer doesn't really wanna get involved in that. They say, you know what, I'm gonna stop using it, right? And that's why the, the devices that are popular are popular because of the software experience, not because of the data they're gathering. Right? If you look at the fuel band, for example, it's dead simple. I wear it, I charge it, and it connects to my phone in, in a single button press. It just works. Right? It's the whole experience. It's not just having a device that measures something and a cobbled together back end. Sub $100 GPS watch. This is an area that um, really started at the, around Christmas last year um, with you see the Solios um, 1.0 watch, and there's a New Balance watch, and uh, now the Timex watch, and, and all these, these watches are the same watch, right? They are literally the same watch. It's like rebranding the, the Dynastream Footpod, right? It's the exact same watch, just with a different branding. Um, but that's kicked off a lot of interest in this segment. And, and at $99, $89, you find them on sale, um, people are saying, you know what? I'll buy that watch, because it's not putting my cell phone in harm's way, right? And so I think this is effectively the new battleground, is how do you go ahead and and get down to that price point um, and make the right decisions there. And you see Garmin, for example, going into near that price point at 120 um, with the Forerunner 10 back uh, last month. Um, so, you know, in their case, they offered something additional beyond what those $100 watches offer. Those $100 watches don't offer download um, capability, um, at least above board download capability, um, whereas the Garmin does, so, but at a $20 premium. Um, so that's where, as you're making devices, how can you hit that market um, and go ahead and still, still offer an experience that's better than a cell phone app? Um, and that, that's an important thing to keep in mind is that, again, people are using free and, and $1 cell phone apps. You've got to do something that, that delivers a different experience for them. Um, and the last thing is kind of interesting. What we're seeing here, though, is that 
companies are undercutting their own, their own products. Um, and in some cases, it's actually really ticking off consumers. It was funny, on the, the Garmin 4Runner 10 review um, that I posted, I was surprised at the number of people that were upset that had bought the Garmin 4Runner 210 um, at some point in the previous year, and were upset because the 110 contained not more, but a fair bit of, of features that the 210 didn't contain, right? Um, so you see them undercutting products, um, and it's, it's a matter of, from your standpoint, how do you find that balance there? Um, and obviously the, the consumers love the, four, the, the, the 10 just because it offers all these new products, but that will ultimately undercut your other products. Accelerometer, so we, we've seen the accelerometer jump into a, a number of watches recently. Um, but none of them are really using it to the fullest potential. Um, you know, we've got the Suunto AM, but using it for fused speed, which is this concept that you can go ahead and kind of stabilize speed in primarily trail running situations by blending um, accelerometer with, with GPS data. Um, Moto Active can use it in place of a foot pod altogether, right? So you can go to a gym and don't have to wear a foot pod on and get treadmill data. Uh, the 910 is using it for swimming data. Um, but really, aside from from those uses, it's fairly limited. Um, Motorola has actually been leading the way here with the Moto Active in developing um, sport profiles that use accelerometer. They have 40 of them today from rope jumping to yoga to Pilates. I mean, it's, it's really astounding. If you look at this list, you sit there and try to figure out how somebody actually came up with this massive list of sports to, to emulate using accelerometer. But this allows those same watches up above, right? There's nothing stopping Sunto from adding a sport profile for, for rope jumping, right? Or, or Garmin doing the same thing. Um, so I think that the accelerometer starts as a base, a place that you can, you can develop from, um, but there's a lot of potential to still go there. So uh, there's been a ton of interest, and obviously as device manufacturers, you've seen this interest in, in watches like Pebble, MetaWatch, and SmartWatch, and you can go on and on with all these different ones that are out there today. Um, these are eff effectively displays, right, that connect to the cell phone and display information from the cell phone. Um, they're not not their own watches, they don't have GPS in them, they don't have anything else. Um, it's just a, a blank display that the cell phone pushes to. Um, this isn't a new space, right? This isn't something that just popped up in the last year. There's actually been attempts at this over the last 10 years. Um, you know, for example, the, the Microsoft Spot Watch. Does anybody recommend that or uh, remember that? That's what I thought. Nobody does, right? Um, because it, it didn't work out because there's, the apps weren't there, right? There wasn't the data pushing to that that was interesting, right? A lot of these watches just, they focus on, I'm going to show my text message data and my email data. Most consumers aren't going to pay one to however many hundreds of dollars for that information. They're going to pull their phone out of their pocket and look at the, the, the screen there. Um, so you've got to find a balance there. You've got to, you've got to get applications onto those platforms. Um, and that's where it gets complex because um, all of these, these different platforms here require different development efforts. If Strava wants to go and develop something for um, Pebble, it doesn't work with MetaWatch. It doesn't work with SmartWatch. So now they've got to decide which horse do they bet on. Right? And in a lot of cases, a lot of these companies are simply saying, you know what, we're not going to bet on any horses right now. We're going to wait and see. Um, because there's still this, this looming cloud in the background, right? And that looming cloud is, is Apple, right? What if Apple comes by and says, we're going to take the Nano in its current form factor and allow app development? Now, as a consumer, who do you think wins? Do you have a black and white display? Or do you have a brilliant color display with the, the application platform of iOS across the board, right? So you look at these companies and you understand why they're kind of holding back and hesitant to, to move forward. And then the apps that are there on those platforms today, I think the bottom right-hand picture, you've all seen the not impressed photo, right? They're not good. If you, if you play with these apps, they're, they, A, they look ugly, um, and B, they have limited functionality, and they're written, for, they're written for people like us. They're written for geeks. They're written for, for developers. They're not written for consumers. Consumers want pretty data. Which goes into Kickstarter projects. Um, I'm, I assume most of you have heard of Kickstarter, but Kickstarter is a platform that allows um, basically folks like yourselves or myself to go ahead and, and uh, bid for a project in a, in a sense. So they've got 30 days or, or 45 days to raise uh, money based on pledges. Um, so I can go ahead and I can say I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pledge my $150, which at the end gives me a reward, and the reward is a, a given device. Um, and that device um, is based on the specifications that that they've committed to. Um, and of course, it's become very, very popular. Pebble raised, I think, close to $10 million in this, this um, method. And, and other watches are following in their footsteps. And there's been a lot of watches, including some Amp Plus watches, um, as well as Bluetooth Low Energy watches that are there. But you can, you can get all sorts of interesting stuff on Kickstarter. It's not just for, for technology. Um, the challenge, though, is that 
is it right for you? And this is, this is kind of a tricky question because it goes down to um, whether or not you want to be associated with a Kickstarter crowd. Right now, that crowd um, is kind of like the motto I say there. It's, it's overcommit, underdeliver, don't communicate, and be late. That is the reputation that Kickstarter has today. Not to say I don't love Kickstarter. I do. I buy all sorts of stuff on Kickstarter. Um, I'm really glad my wife can't actually just log in and see all the things I bought on Kickstarter right now um, because I've got like, I've got a lot of things. You'll probably watch this later on. So um, that are on there. Um, <laughs> but you know what? You know it's the only thing I've actually received in the year of Kickstarter so far? That bottom right hand picture. And what is that? That is a simple leather strap. That is the only successful project out of Kickstarter. Actually, I got one that arrived Monday as my flight was leaving. Um, but beyond that, that's it, right? It's a, it's a leather strap that holds up your bike so you can put it on the, the bottom and, and pick it up and go up steps and things like that easily. All the other technology products have been delayed, right? I have products that should have been delivered a year ago that are still not here today. Um, so if you're getting Kickstarter, you've got to be sure that you, you can actually deliver on the promises you make and don't overcommit. Um, and that's, there, there's a ton of great tech press written about Kickstarter and getting into it, um, but just be warned, right? It's, it's an area you've got to make sure you do it right, otherwise um, you'll become just another one of these, these companies here. <laughs> You're not late yet. You've got, you got some time still. Um, so I was not singling out these, these three at the bottom. These are Kickstarter examples, but they are not the ones that are necessarily late yet. There are, there are plenty of others that are late today. Um, the 3G connection. So this is an interesting area that I don't believe is tapped yet. I think this is the one area that, um, I've been beating the hammer probably for two years now, um, that has so much potential. Um, and this is an area that you can go ahead and, if you look at your phones today, right? So this morning when Simon was up here, many of you were taking pictures of him. And those pictures were automatically tagged with the location. You probably then tweet them out and put them on Facebook or whatever. And that data then shows that you were up here um, in this city that I can't pronounce. Um, and, and that gave you location information. Athletes and other folks want the same information while they're running, right? And today they get that through um, applications, iPhone apps and things like that. Um, but there are certain reasons why they don't want to carry their phone with them. Um, if, if there weren't those reasons, then many of you making devices wouldn't wouldn't have jobs, right? So um, why is there not yet connectivity in those devices straight um, to 3G and other cellular networks today? And, and there, are some, there are some first attempts at this. You know, I bought, um, I bought these watches that were, actually one was a kid's brand of watch and one was an adult brand of watch. Um, and I could put a SIM card in it and it would track me and, and anybody can go online and put a URL in and see where I was at any point in time. And that was that. Um, and it cost like $65 and I bought it from some no-name company I've never heard of in, in Asia and, and arrived. And, and I could not sneeze in this thing without killing it from a waterproofing standpoint, right? So it's got a long way to go, but, but if a company if a, if a no-name company can do it for $60 and deliver that, and if the only challenge right now is, is waterproofing, then I think that you as a group can, can do the same thing but to, to move that forward, right? And, and there have been some attempts at this. There have been um, some attempts at 3G tracking, like the Garmin GTU, for example, does it, but they don't have AMP Plus data in there. So it's great for, for basic location tracking, but not great for race data. Um, there's been a few other, other companies that have tried it, but the pricing models haven't worked out. Um, so it's not just a device, it's also the pricing model as well. So the big elephant in the room, Bluetooth, smart, or ant. Um, the first line says it all. It's not an or question. Um, companies ask me this every single week, and I tell the same answer every single week. It's not or, it's both, right? If you're a consumer right now, and you're trying to buy a device, and you're choosing between a device that has just ant plus, or just Bluetooth, or both, which one do you do choose, right? People don't want to be locked in to one or the other. They don't want to throw away all the gear they have today from Ant Plus, and they don't want to be, you know, stranded and buying new gear a year from now when there's some new Bluetooth smart accessory out there or new Ant Plus accessory out there. Put both in this. Um, we saw Moto Active and Motorola really lead the way with this, and they're in the Moto Active last year adding Ant Plus, Bluetooth, and Wi-Fi. Uh, that was like the holy grail, right? You walk into your house and um, just boom, it uploads. It, it's perfect. Um, this has got to be the way forward, and, and you'll see in a, in a few slides, the products I'm excited about are the products that are bridging this gap. They're the products that are, that are saying, we're giving the consumers choice, we're letting them be flexible on this, um, and that way they don't have to make those decisions um, down the road on accessories or throw away the accessories they have today. Um, the one thing to be aware of, though, is that Bluetooth Smart is fragmented. This is fragmented. I say this not just standing in front of an Amp Plus audience. I say this from the standpoint of um, 
make sure you use the devices. Make sure you understand how those devices interoperate. Um, and some of those same challenges were there you know, five or so years ago with, with AMP Plus devices as well, right? Manufacturers didn't follow the, the protocol. Um, they implemented those poorly, and then the consumer suffered. Um, and we see the same here as well. I, I know of a, a company making a power meter on Bluetooth Smart that's not following the, the almost formalized power meter protocol. Um, and I don't think that's going to be a terribly successful product long term because they're not following that protocol. Um, at this point in time, in, in, that, in that development life cycle, this is not the place to kind of be solo, right? You, you want to be on that bandwagon with everybody else because you want your devices to work with everybody else. Um, you know, if you go back to the summer and even now, there's a lot of uh, Bluetooth smart devices that just fundamentally do not work with each other, right? I should be able to take a Bluetooth smart heart rate strap with a Bluetooth smart compatible head unit and they should work. And today they don't, right? I have to have certain brands and have to be programmed. It's just, it's not there yet today. It will be, but it's not there yet today. File format mess. Um, you know, two years ago, I really harped on, on areas where um, file formats were a problem. Um, and, and you may say this is a highly technical thing, but it's not. It's actually a very basic consumer thing. Um, consumers want choice. They want choice in the apps they use to analyze their data um, and where their data sits and, and how they can access their data. Um, if, you, if you architect a, a device to use a file format that nobody can read except yourself, you've created an island. And in doing that, um, your consumers don't have a way to get their data from point A to point B, and they don't have a way to get it into their existing collections. And I can tell you, more times than not, consumers won't buy your product. Um, I see it every single time that a, a company comes with a, a product that has a, an island of data format that's just unto their own. What, what we've seen, though, is acceptance on fit file format. Um, and I know you'll, you would say, well, that's, that's, that's Garmin's formats or just for Garmin's devices, and, and it's not. And I, I think we've seen that with a number of, of devices in the room here now that are, that are not Garmin devices that are using the, the fit format. Um, and, and they're using the correct fit format, not almost fit, not 99% fit, but fit as it's written, as it's designed, right? Because when you do that, it means that you instantly open up your device to all the third-party websites out there today, right? Everything from Strava to RunKeeper to Training Peaks to Daily Mile to Slow Twitch to, you can go on and on, right? There's hundreds of these websites out there today. And they all support the big devices. They all support the devices that have the most um, demand for support. Um, so if you can put yourself in the same category and say, yep, if you support a Garmin device, then you'll support my device, that makes an easy decision for consumers. Um, and you've got to understand this also from the perspective of these third parties, these, these websites. You know, I've talked to Strava and RunKeeper and Training Peaks in the last week. From their perspective, they simply cannot maintain um, development across different devices for different file formats. They just can't. They just won't develop for that. I mean, Strava and RunKeeper in particular have pretty much said, we're stopping, stopping making custom development for, for companies and, and devices. It's these standard device formats or you're not getting uploaded to Strava. Um, and I, if I was designing, designing a device, I would not want to be on the wrong side of, of uploading to Strava. So uh, phone fitness apps. I get a lot of requests to review phone fitness apps, a lot of requests. Um, probably like one a day type requests. Um, the thing is, there's very little innovation here. They're all the same. Uh, back in two years ago, September 2010, um, the Apple Store guidelines actually said, quote, verbatim, we don't need any more fart apps, right? What they were saying, though, really, is we need better fart apps, right? <laughs> and that's, that's true of fitness as well. Um, there is hundreds, hundreds of fitness apps that track GPS, where I went, how far I went, right? If you're gonna design an app that does that, it better do something really, really, really special. Otherwise, a consumer is gonna go where the rest of the crowd is, and the rest of the crowd is the folks on the previous page there. Um, so, you need to ensure that if you're designing an app that's fitness focused, that it's genuinely doing something unique. It's doing something that nobody else is doing. I think you know, we saw Jim Pact a second ago. That's an area where it's doing something unique. Um, it, it's going into an area that isn't, isn't populated today and, and driving the consumer in a different direction than just here's how far you went and here's how fast you went. Um, you know, Graphical, graphical experience is probably the most important thing um, when it comes to these apps. I would almost even wager more important than having the app be fully functional itself. Um, because a consumer, when they're looking at the Apple Store or the um, Google Play, they're gonna look at the screenshots first. They won't even download the app unless the screenshots looks good, right? It, they're just, there's no, no place for applications that, that don't look good anymore. Um, so that, that's really important. 
Um, another area that is, is ensuring that you have integration with your devices. Um, you know, your device manufacturers, um, therefore, there should be some method to get my data from my device to my phone, because ultimately the phone is where the user is living today. And, and the, the thing here is it's not an, an either or conversation, right? You know, I think there's been a lot of focus on, is it, are you using the phone app or using the device? Um, we're seeing that the companies are starting to bridge those two together, saying, I'm using the device, but I'm uploading the phone app. Um, you know, the, there's a lot, of, a lot of devices that do this, but the Garmin Phoenix does this today, right? I can go ahead and I can connect over Bluetooth between the Garmin Phoenix watch and upload my data into the app and view it there. Um, the app isn't terribly functional beyond that one particular component, but it's a start, right? And I think that's the trend that you're gonna see with, with applications from devices, is how can you bridge those two, those two gaps? Um, athletes are still concerned about phone breakage. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of focus on, on apps, um, and, and folks that may run three to five miles are gonna use that, um, but I don't see it as heavy adoption at folks that are running 20 or, or plus miles every single day. Um, that's, that's not where you're seeing, because of the concern around breakage of, phone, um, breakage of phones. Um, but if you look at something like the Xperia Active, right, which is the waterproof, shockproof app, um, to show you how much interest in there, I shot two little YouTube videos last year just for fun. One, I went for 15 minutes into the swimming pool um, and showed the phone in the swimming pool underwater being used. And then I put another one where I took a bunch of sports gel, right, you know, the goopy stuff that you athletes drink, um, and I poured it over the phone and I washed it off, right? In less than a year, those two videos almost have almost 700,000 views, people looking at that, right? There's extreme interest in, in using phones that, um, as fitness platforms that, that are waterproof and, and shockproof. Um, so don't discount that, but that's where the focus, where a lot of people want those to be. They're just not comfortable taking the brand new iPhone 5 um, out yet for a ride. So what are the products that excite me today? Um, these four, these are the four that have just been announced in the last month or so, and these are the ones that I am super jazzed about. I think first is, is Wahoo's Kicker. Um, and the reason here is that yes, there's been a lot of trainers in the past, but there's been no trainers that are completely open, right, completely open platform, which means that anybody in this room can develop against that trainer if they want to, and I know some of you certainly are, um, but people outside of this room can as well. Um, it's Sports Amp Plus, it's Bluetooth, Low Energy, I can bridge that gap and I can do anything I want with this. If I was a trainer company right now, I'd be very, very scared of this trainer um, because it's just, it's everything that, that somebody wants, right? And that potential is there to be everything that somebody wants a year from now as well. Four Eyes, uh, Viva Amp Plus, BTLE Heart Rate Strap, um, this is huge. Um, I don't think this can be understated how big this is. A, a single heart rate strap that can bridge those two together. Um, to, to pull those two worlds and say, I'm taking Amp Plus devices and funneling it up to Bluetooth One Energy, um, or vice versa, or any which way you want to go. And I know there's certainly some, some final technical challenges there to be, to be dealt with over the next few months, but this is enormous for consumers, right? Especially if it's priced at the same price point as other devices um, in, that, in that heart rate strap range. Wahoo's Reflect. Um, so you heard me talk about all those wrist-based watches that um, display data from the cell phone. Reflect is kind of the same concept, but for cyclists. Um, so it's a cycling bike um, display unit. So now you've got an open bike display unit. So now companies like Strava or, or Runkeeper or Map My Fitness or whatever can actually develop an app for that, that platform. Um, and they can control that end to end. You know, if you sit there with Strava, uh, imagine that you can have your phone communicating that you've just um, you know, bested a given segment in real time or that you're three seconds behind on that pacing for that segment in real time. Um, that goes back to how people like to interact in the social aspect of it as well. Um, so that's huge. And then the stage one power meter. This is interesting because of the lower price point. It's priced at $699, which is for a bit lower than most of our power meters at, at the crank, um, crank area. Um, and it's cross, pro cross protocol, which I think is honestly the most important piece to me here, is that it's, it's Bluetooth energy as well as AMP Plus. Again, protecting the consumer and saying, we're gonna offer you both of those long term. You, you don't have to choose one or the other, and you're good to go. So let's talk about engaging the consumer. Um, first I wanna talk about kind of the four big frustrations that folks have today. These are the ones that I get comments every single day on these, these items. Um, the first is that product quality levels have decreased, decreased in 2012. No question in my mind about that. Um, we've seen more products, but the quality of those products has gone down. Um, we see more bugs making it to final, final release where you know, consumers are getting a, a product in the store and it's still buggy. Um, with manufacturers promising, we'll release those updates soon, we'll release them soon, and they never come, or they come three or four months later. Um, 
which goes into frustration of the lack of follow through, right? Consumers are becoming wary of companies that don't release a product um, that does what it says it does, uh, meaning it has the features it promised and it makes sure the features actually work. Um, they also want consistency in those updates, right? So they don't want to get surprised by an update every nine months or some bizarre schedule. They want to know that the company has promised me an update and I'm going to get that update on X date. Um, we're seeing Sunto and Moto Active have done a great job on this. Um, Sunto said back in the, the spring, they said we're going to release an update in May, we're going to release an update in September, we're going to release an update in November. And here's the features for each of those updates. Um, and they've got, well, they've got three days to get September out. Um, but, but the point is they're, they're nailing those time frames, they're nailing the features that people want, right? And they've released it and made it, made it understandable. Moto Active, the same thing. Moto Active went back this, this past spring and said, here are the, the release dates for their given sets of enhancements. Here's the exact date we're hitting and all the enhancements. Very predictable, allows consumers to make decisions based on that. Um, the next one is sharing devices between family members. There is, to my knowledge, no device today, mainstream device or even non-mainstream device, that I can say, I am Joe and I'm Jane and I'm out for a different run, right? It knows my profile, knows who I am, and allows me to, to pick one of the two and allows a family to share devices. Um, which is ironic because almost all the cycling devices, for example, have multiple bikes, right? You can choose bike one, two, three, four, five, up to even eight bikes in some products. Um, but, but people, if they're gonna spend $400 on a watch, they'd prefer if they can to go ahead and have that watch work with multiple people in the same family. Um, so I think, you know, if we can see this, this grow into those devices, that'll probably increase adoption for folks that are teetering between cell phones and devices. If they can say, well, we're gonna share this in a family, that, that may push them over the edge. Um, especially given the, the high price gap between cell phone apps and those standalone devices. So engaging where the consumers are today, I think it's important to know that the consumers are wherever Google leads them to, right? Um, it's really that simple. They, they type something in the search box and Google ten, sends them off their way and, and they go somewhere. Um, Google understands the difference between marketing content and non-marketing content, right? Google's looking for what's called the unique content, right? Which means that they're looking for things that are, aren't anywhere else on the internet um, and have the number of terms and, the, and the, the success rate of things that people are looking for. Um, this is all very basic, you know, CO 101, Search Engine Optimization 101. So if you think about that in terms of your product, what that means is that you can use that same knowledge to, to follow where people are talking about your products. And once you know where they're talking about their products, you can enter that conversation in that same location. Um, the next way to find out where they're looking for your products is Google News Alerts. You know, I talked about this last year a little bit. Um, if you don't have Google News Alerts set up today in your products, just do that by the end of the day. Um, for example, if anybody mentions the word DC Rainmaker anywhere in the internet, I get alert for it, right? Um, I, I know immediately, sometimes within seconds, that, that Engadget or Gizmodo has picked up one of my, my posts because I get alert from, from Google's News. Uh, my wife's cupcake shop in, in Paris, the same thing. If somebody writes something about it, within a few seconds she hears that alert. Um, that's, that's an easy way for you to figure out where your consumers are today and where you should engage them in conversations. In doing so, you might find some interesting things. I think one of the funny ones here is this, this thread that was on Slow Twitch. Um, and the thread was, the title was, Quark, what do you not like about it, right? And, and in doing so, what you found was that, in the case of Quark, they tried really, really hard, somebody, to, to find out what people didn't like about Quark. In this four-page thread, there was really nothing that people didn't like about Quark. Every single person came back and said, the only thing I don't like about it is I don't have two. The only thing I don't like about it is fill in the blank. And it was kind of funny. Um, but what you see, the reason why you see that is because their involvement in some of those places, right? So if you look at the top two companies that I see involved in online forums and, and in that social sphere, it's Polar and Quark. Um, I can go on to numerous different online forums and, and Polar is there and they're happy to answer questions all day long. Um, they're not shying away from it. And then the same with Quark. Quark is across a lot of different areas. Um, and that, I think, drives that, that consumer attachment. Um, you know, I know forums are, are kind of, uh, they're dangerous, there's a dangerous ground, right? They're like a big, bit of a minefield. Um, so a couple things to think about. It's one to many, right? You're, you're able to deliver a message um, to a whole lot of people in one sentence. Um, if you pick up the phone and answer a support call, you're delivering that message to one person and it'll last a couple seconds. That person likely is not gonna post it somewhere else on the internet, um, but that, that's the end of that entire connection between you and the customer. Um, versus a forum, if you go on the forum, 
that answer is there forever, right? That means that folks can search on it and they can solve their problems quickly. Um, so when you talk about you know, return rates of products, um, if somebody on a Saturday morning um, has a problem with their device and they go and they find the answer to that device um, at that point in time, that'll keep them from returning it as opposed to waiting and, or just returning it that afternoon at the local shop, right? So you can see how even if you don't have the answer on your website, by having it somewhere else, um, you can go ahead and, and gain that traction on your products. Um, forum owners, forum owners love this, right? Why? Because it increases their search rankings. And when you increase their search rankings, you increase the number of page views that you get. When you increase the number of page views you get, you increase advertising revenue. Um, so forum owners love to have used device manufacturers present on their forums. Um, it's the greatest thing for them. Um, but don't BS users. Um, if you as a company go to a forum and try to walk circles around users, I guarantee you there's always somebody there that is as smart as you, if not smarter, right? So make sure that you just lay it how it is. Even if it's not the best, even if it's not the, the greatest answer in the world, even if it's one you say, you know what, we don't offer that feature and here's why, that's much better than trying to dance around it and, and BS users. Because I guarantee you, you'll never win that argument. Um, and then figure out where these forms are. Look at your start referral figures. Um, you know, I'm sure all of you use some sort of Google Analytics or Site Meter or something like that. Um, you can very easily see where people are talking about your products. Um, in the same way that I, at the beginning I talked about that you know, quarter of a million um, referrals, I can see where people are talking about my post, you can see where people are talking about your products, and address them there. Um, go to those places and, and enter that conversation. Um, it'll increase your customer satisfaction a ton. Um, and if you have your own forms, actually visit them. Um, there are some companies that have forms that never visit their own forms, um, which seems kind of backwards to having forms, right? Um, but so if you do have forms, make sure you're there, you're an online presence, and, and you're, you're answering the questions there as opposed to just letting it run rampant. And this is, you can download this later on, but this is kind of a quick list of the forms for the, the sport um, areas here. You know, a couple things to keep in mind um, is that always listen before talking in forums. Different, different forums have different vibes, right? You know, if you go to Slow Twitch, it's a very, very different vibe than if you go to um, Beginner Triathlete. Um, two entirely different worlds. Um, so make sure you're, you're, you're making, you're aware of the, the culture and the community you're entering into. Um, and at the bottom, swimming devices. Let's be honest, nobody talks about swimming devices because swimmers don't wear devices. Um, so using social media correctly, there's a lot of talk about how you can dive into social media. The first thing is don't try to boil the ocean. Don't, don't try to sit there and go, I'm gonna open up a Google+, a Facebook, a Tumblr, a, all these things in one afternoon. Um, start small, start with just, just Twitter or just Facebook and go from there, right? And, and keep it simple. Um, realize though that all, all social media avenues are not the same. When we say social media, it's a collection of many, many different things. You know, yesterday on the, on the airplane, um, the, the flight attendant said to me, would you like airplane beef or airplane chicken? Um, and somebody up in front said, what's the difference? He said, there is no difference, right? Um, in this case here, there is a difference, right? Um, meaning that there is a very distinct difference between how you approach Facebook and how you approach Twitter versus how you approach Google Plus versus how you approach something else. Um, understand those, those different communities and, and how, to, how to talk to them. Um, also understand it's not just a one-way marketing channel. If you simply sit there and post your press releases to that, um, your consumers won't be interested in that. It's gotta be a two-way dialogue. It's gotta be when somebody posts on your Facebook page, hey, I'm having a problem with something, it's gotta be, sure, let's, let's see how I can help you there. Um, other consumers see that. Other consumers go to your Facebook page and they see those conversations and they say, yeah, this is, this is something worthwhile following. That way when you announce a new product at CES and you announce it there, that goes straight into the inbox of every single Facebook fan that you have, right? They, wouldn't, they would never look at that if you didn't have that, that uh, active conversation to begin with. Um, and just consider dedicating an hour to a day to, get, hour a day to it initially. Um, don't try to spend all day on it. Don't try to do anything complex. Just, just start simple. Another way you can engage your consumers is running a beta program. Um, beta programs enable you to get that critical feedback. And I know many of you run beta programs today with your, your products. That's, that's kind of common. Um, but the challenge is many companies run beta programs that are friends and family, right? This isn't the Verizon like friends and family deal where you want to keep it as close as you can. Um, you really want to expand out your, your critical feedback to people that don't know you personally, right? Um, because those are the folks that are going to give you the feedback that you ultimately need. Um, what I have tend to found is that you know, if you give a device to somebody that's a friend and family, they're going to be too nice to you. They're not going to tell you what's, what's fundamentally wrong. If you get, give it to John or Jane Doe on the internet, in most cases, they're going to be really happy to tell you what's wrong with that device. 
Um, but that's what you want, because if you can solve those problems up front, you'll never have them when it comes time to release that product for real. Um, it also builds excitement about your product. You know, obviously, you have certain areas, certain times, you want that product to be under NDA. Um, I found that most companies that work with, with regular people out on the internet, um, those people respect those NDAs. Um, and I, I think you know, that, that balance between giving products to, to unknowns, and saying, hey, we've got a new product, we can't talk about it yet, but we want beta testers for it, um, and getting people that are really excited about your product means that come release time, come release day, uh, let's say you release tomorrow, you now have this pool of 25, 50, 100 people who on that day know all about your product and you can talk about your product anywhere, right? They can sit there and answer questions on Facebook, or Twitter, or all those forums we talked about earlier. You've now increased your, your PR and marketing front from one or two people to 100 people, right? And you've also got all the, the benefits from a, a development standpoint as well. Um, and it doesn't cost you anything, right? In most cases, the devices are, are relatively small. You're gonna ship out devices to people and ship them back, but people aren't looking for, um, for payment for this, right? They're just, they just wanna play with things, and that's, that's really it. Um, Ambassador programs and sponsorships. So there's two ways you can approach, approach these in sport today. Um, you know, from a pro level sponsorship, what's the benefit there of your products, right? You gain visibility of it, um, potential media placement, meaning that if, if somebody takes a, a picture of Simon Whitfield um, you know, coming across the, the finish line at a race, they may see, see your logo on it. Um, it also helps validation of the product, right? If, if Simon's using it, then, then obviously it's, it's good for everybody because Simon's using it. Um, and you can also support up and coming pros, right? So it doesn't have to be Simon, right? Simon is, is awesome, but there is a ton of upcoming pros out there who would be happy to, to give you that exposure to your product um, and to talk about your product. Um, you know, speaking of Simon, he did mention Jordan Rapp this morning, you know, um, as another pro out there. Um, Jordan is a, is a very good pro, um, but more than that, he's very, very involved in the community. Um, he goes onto these forums and answers questions. He has um, his famous ask me anything about fill in the blank, and it's ask me anything about Iron Man New York City. And these, these posts go hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of comments long where people are asking him about um, either products he uses or, or his daily routine. Um, that's the kind of involvement you want when you're talking a pro sponsorship. Um, look at your pro sponsorships and say, what is this person doing for you, right? Because ultimately that's why you're, you're paying them in some sort of currency, whether it be product or support or just flat out money. Um, ensure that those people are actually um, giving something back to your company through communities because communities is what drives um, adoption across users. Um, people are far more likely to buy a product because Jordan Rapp uses it um, than a pro that crossed the finish line. Uh, because people quite simply have blinders on to product placement on most pros. If you if a, if a professional triathlete ran across right now here and had a bunch of logos on his uniform, I'd be willing to bet none of you even notice those logos at all, right? You just don't, you've, you've turned that off. Um, what people do notice though is involvement in answering, answering others. The second part of is age group level sponsorships. Um, and sponsorship is kind of an interesting term here because in a lot of cases, they're really more about ambassador programs. Um, in other words, the difference between a sponsorship is that you're usually paying somebody something, right? And, and typically in cash or something else, whereas, in an age group level ambassador program, um, you're looking to go ahead and seed them product um, and to seed them some level of exposure, right? You know, you'll, you'll link to their blog on, on your corporate blog or, or something like that. Um, what you see here though is that these folks are not typically at the pointy end of the pack. They're usually middle of the pack or back of the pack from a, a speed and results standpoint. Um, but they're also tend to have more influence. Um, in a lot of cases, I see that age groupers that are using products in ambassador programs have more influence over pros, um, simply because within their social circles, people trust, uh, people tend to trust people that they know aren't being paid off, right? And so if they have somebody that, that's a friend, they, they see on Facebook that says, um, hey, I'm using this product and it's working out well for me, they put more stock on that than a, than a pro that has a logo on their uniform. I'm um, not saying to do one or the other, but I think it's, it's a approach with both. So it comes as I start to wind down a little bit, um, understanding how to launch a product. Um, I'm not a PR person, um, but I'm in an interesting position where I gotta see all the PR and I gotta see successful product launches. And I'll, I'll give you some hard cold numbers in a second on, on different ways to launch a product as far as page views, which is one of the ways I can, I can quantify that. Um, the first thing is, this may sound obvious, but have a product or within three months of being ready, right? If you have a product that's not coming out until next uh, October, right? You've lost that consumer interest already. 
the consumer looks at that and says, oh, they're a tech company. So October really means January beyond that, right? Um, so you've got to have something that's tangible immediately. Um, there's very little trust anymore in this industry for, for products that are beyond just a few months away. Um, have a specific date for a product. In other words, have a date and a time. Uh, you know, the, one of the companies I work with always launches their products usually on Tuesday morning at 7 a.m. Even if it's Monday morning, it's always 7 a.m. Right? They're, they're launching to a given time because when you do that, you can drive media focus at that. Right? And you can say your, your embargo is released at 7 a.m. and then you have a flurry of activity at 7 a.m. If you don't, then, then media outlets simply say, well, I'll get to it when I get to it. Right? Because uh, as media, you want to be the first there. You want to make sure that at 7 a.m. you have the best story about it. Um, if there's no timeline for it, it, it falls down the stack a bit of, of things that are, that are useful. Um, obviously, reach out to those media outlets. Um, you know, use a PR person if you have to. I know Brad is in here somewhere as a PR person. Um, but I think it's, it's definitely just as important, if not more important, to establish those relationships with the media directly. Um, so in, in the case of, just to use Wahoo as an example, right? I know, I know uh, Chip and, and Mike back there, and I talk to them, and I also communicate to Brad as, as their PR person. I'm communicating them both, and I'm understanding how to talk to them. That way, even if Brad can't answer a very technical question about something, I know the right person to go to. You want to make sure you have that same relationship um, within your company and the, and the folks that you're talking to in the media. Have non-PR shots available. I can't stress how important this is. People look at PR shots, and they can spot PR shots a mile away, right? And there's two problems there. One, PR shots get duplicated across the internet lightning fast, which means that any text tied to those shots from a Google search engine standpoint goes down, because now you have it across a 1,000 places as opposed to across just a handful. Have shots on your website that are unique. They're yours. You went outside and shot those shots. Those are the things people want to see. They don't want computer-generated stuff, because computer-generated stuff implies that the product may not be real. Um, so have something real, have something tangible. Stages Cycling last week did this with their, their product launch on Tuesday. Um, when, they, when they launched the website, the website had all the PR stuff that you ever want, but it also had an incredibly in-depth FAQ, an incredibly in-depth list of all the things they supported. There was no ambiguity, right? It, it, once that website was launched, there was very little question left in people's mind, which means people could start making purchasing decisions on that. If people can't make purchasing decisions based on the information you provide to them, they may not wait for your product. Um, so you want to you wanna remove any question you have or any question they have about your product. So here are four product launches. Um, four different products, all popular products, all within the last roughly six months. Um, and these are the four approaches that the companies have, have used. And what these web page view numbers are, are the page views that product got on my site that day of their launch, right? So the 7 a.m. approach, got them 36,000 page views of that review, right? 36,000 people went and read that review on that one product on that one day. Um, the trickle something approach, right? This is the approach where you say, something's coming next week, be ready for it, right? We're gonna announce something on Tuesday. That got 29,000 hits. The, the trickle product hint approach, this basically says, we're gonna release a bike computer next Tuesday. Um, or you may start off a month before, we're gonna release something, and we're gonna release a bike computer, we're gonna release a bike computer with blah, right? You see that gets less because people have lost interest in this, right? People have said, eh, I, I may not want it already. The do not announce it at all approach, right? <laughs> this is an approach where the company had not announced anything. They didn't announce anything in the media at all. They didn't use any media PR folks. They just simply said, eh, it's available now, right? And that was it. And my, my review is the only, only reference to that product at that point in time. It just happened to pop up on the internet, and, and that was that. Um, and you can see the the difference there, right? I can drive a lot of traffic, but ultimately you have to build excitement outside of just me. Um, so the more that you, you focus on a given time and date, the bigger your product launches will be. So I get a lot of questions, um, especially here about how you can engage with me. Uh, the first thing is that I, I do a lot of discussions that are, that are NDA, that are just, just chatting behind the scenes, right? And, you know, for example, I, I remember sitting with um, Clark from Magellan two years ago outside at at our, one of the nights we had putt-putt golf, right? Greg Lamont's out there hitting golf uh, balls at beer cans, and um, um, Clark and I are sitting there, I am freezing. That's the only thing I remember about this conversation is I was absolutely freezing, because I was in there a t-shirt and jeans, and it was what you see at night at 8, 8 p.m. But that's a lot of the conversations I have with many of you, right? They're just, we're just chatting about your product and understanding from purely a uh, technology geek to technology geek what you're planning. I'm not looking to 
to release any information about that. Um, and I'm kind of in a unique position where I don't have editors breathing on my neck, right? I don't have anybody sitting there saying, you need to go here, you need to write about these things, right? I come here, and I've got two and a half days to chat with you. That's it, right? I, I've, in, in three minutes, I'll be done presenting, and I can spend the next two days chatting with you about products. Um, whereas if I was writing for a, a magazine, I have set deadlines and set things I'm trying to hit. Um, so anyways, the first method here is that um, NDA discussions. So these are things where you may be two years out, like Clark was, or you may be um, three months out and you want to discuss something that's NDA within, within, between me and you. Um, or sort of some sort of private beta feedback program, right? So I test plenty of products that never see the light of day on dcrainmaker.com, right? They're just merely things I go out and I test and I use and I provide feedback back to the company on, on what I think purely from a beta user, just like the ambassador programs we talked about in the beta programs, the same sort of thing. Method two, product launch time review. So you saw on the previous page how important product launch time reviews can be. Um, so in this case, I'm usually working with a product ahead of time, um, usually for ideally a month or so, um, and, and playing with that product even while it's in beta and even while the kinks are still being worked out and you're delivering firmware updates to me. And then when it comes time for that product to launch, then I'm writing a review. The, the goal and focus of this isn't to sit there during that time period and even announce or even talk about the product, right? So in a lot of cases, I don't even mention I have it because it's still an NDA. And it's not to sit there and, and write about your bugs. Um, I understand you have bugs in software. Um, your bugs during your, your beta cycles are your bugs. They're not, they're not for me to, to broadcast to the world. Um, your bugs, once you release a, a production product that is out there and available to buy, they're not your bugs anymore, right? They're, they're public information at that point. Um, but I'm not going to go back and say, well, they had a bug in this, this thing back then. It's, I'm not interested in that. Um, and then finally, post-release review. This is a product that's already in the market that you may want me to review at some point. Um, this obviously has kind of lowest priority in, in the world of me, um, just because there's a lot of things going on. But this is certainly another area that, that you can engage with me and say, hey, I'd like you to review this product. And, and I can go ahead and take a look at it and decide if it makes sense. Um, Finally, other ways to work with me. Um, I, a lot of people have asked about this recently. I actually do workshops with some companies. Um, so I've gone and sat with companies for a day um, with the development team, the marketing teams, and basically done just what I've done here for the last 45 minutes or an hour. Um, and I've done it with a company for an entire day and, and sat there through their ideas and said, no, that's not what consumers want, or yes, this is what people want. Um, and we've had some really good discussions based on that. Um, I don't charge for this. I don't, I don't think I could charge for it and then come back and review your product six months, a year later. Um, that's, again, the same thing as accepting money at that point. My only ask is if I'm going to spend money with you, or it's not spending, if I'm going to spend time with you, that you just simply pick up my plane ticket. That's it. Um, I do it because it's interesting to me. As a technology geek, it's fun to go talk to other technology geeks and sit there and, and brainstorm about things. Um, but those conversations are all siloed to you. Um, and in some cases, you know, some companies want that information public afterwards and say, hey, here's, here's what we worked on. But in most cases, they're very, very private. Um, and this is typically done early in the release phase, right? Usually in alpha release. If you're, if you're talking with me six days before your product launches, that's probably not going to be um, ideal from a, a feedback standpoint. So with that, um, I'm here all the way till Friday morning this time. And I usually leave the same night. But uh, I'm here all the way Friday morning and, and happy to, to talk with, with anybody. So thank you very much. I appreciate it.